Welcome back everyone, we're back again. Uh, we're having another look at the new uh, release on Earth Arcana, the one around the Sorcerer and Warlock. We have the new Sorcerer's or Origin Aberrant Mind, and we have the war new war uh, otherworldly patron for the Warlock, the Lurker in the Deep. Um, let's just dive straight in and see what this, this is all about. Obviously, as per usual, uh, this document provides played test options for uh, for the Sorcerer Warlock. It also presents a new counter Mind Sliver. I had a quick look at that, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, of course, this is playtest content. Uh, the material in this article is presented for playtesting and to spark your imagination. These game mechanics are in draft form, usable in your campaign, but not refined for final game design and editing. So um, you couldn't really use these in Adventures Leagues. Um, they aren't officially part of the game and aren't permitted to be used in D&D Adventures League events, like I just said. Uh, if we decide to make this material official, it would appear and refined uh, based on your feedback and then appear in a D&D book. But uh, yeah, so we have Sorcerer's Origin. At first level, uh, Sorcerer gains the Sorcerer's Origin feature. Here is a playtest play test option for the feature Aberrant Mind. So Aberrant Mind. An alien influence has wrapped its tendrils around you, warping you in both body and mind. Perhaps a psychic splinter lodged in your psyche after you suffered domination by an abolith. Maybe you were born somewhere tainted by the Far Realm, a planar blot that changed you forever. Or perhaps Mind Flares kidnapped you, subjecting you to the nightmarish pro process of... Ceramorphosis, Ceramorphosis, I have probably seen that wrong, wrong, but the transformation failed and left you altered. Um, a unique disturbance, Regar regardless of its genesis, the aberrant mind origin imparts a sense of eeriness to the character or their surroundings. This can be subtle as when your sorcerer reads a creature's minds with detect thoughts, anyone in the immediate vicinity experiences a faint but pervasive sense of dread. Or it could be unmistakable, such as a sweating sheen of vis viscous mucus, uh, mucus when you're scared, or your pupils squirming when you're excited. Cons uh, consider the potentially unspeakable source of your sorcerer's powers, and use that as a guide to weave threads of airiness throughout your magic. It's just to make it seem like not the generic magic that's around, even though magic is not a very common found thing in D&D at times. Um, but like this way, it's very off kilter of the standard norm normality of it uh so we have at first level we have the invasive thoughts uh, feature at first level you gain the ability to use a bonus action to magically create a telepathic link with one creature you can see within 30 feet of you until the link ends you can telepathically speak that target through the link and if it understands at least one language it can speak telepathically to you the link lasts for 10 minutes and it ends er early if you are incapacitated or die or if you use another bonus action to break the link or establish this link with a different creature Oh, that's interesting. Very much like um, what they had in uh, Critical Role in the first campaign when they had the earrings that allowed them to uh, speak to each other. But uh, yeah, this seems very interesting as a bonus action. That is handy if you definitely want to, um, maybe if you're having a fight with a sentient being and you want to say, okay, come around the back and stab him and I'll keep him distracted here without actually having to say a word. That'd be a very interesting uh, little idea. <laughs> Uh, psionic spells. Uh, starting at first level, your aberrant nature changes your mind in subtle but profound ways. You learn additional spells when you reach certain levels in this class, as shown on the psionic spells table. The spell counts as a sorcerer spell for you, but it doesn't count against the number of spells you know. These spells can't be replaced when you gain a level in the class. Okay, so the spells you learn at first level are Arms of Adar, the Sonnet Whispers, third level Cam, of, cam Emotions, Detect Thoughts, fifth level Hunger of Adar, Sending, 7th level uh, Compulsion, Evard's Black, Evard's Black Tentacles, a ninth level Modified Memory, and Rari's, R Rari's Telepathic Bond. Probably Rari or Rari. Oh, I wish they had some like pronunciation beside them. Uh, warped Being, uh, first level Aberrant Mind feature. Starting at first level, your Aberrant Origin protects you from harm. Your body might have a coating of... Uh, Viscous slime, tough hide scales, or an invisible psionic barrier. Choose the form of protection whenever you gain this feature. Whatever you're at the form your protection takes, your AC equals your equal 13 plus your dexterity armor while you aren't wearing armor. That's very interesting. Very handy. Although you could just go uh, turtle and get like an AC of 17. <laughs> uh, rule AC calculations don't stack. So obviously, yeah. So if you're going to be wearing armor, it's going to be whatever the armor bonus is. So like, it could be like 12 plus... Your dex bonus up to plus two or something and stuff like that so you can't have you can't wear um all different armors and try to get them stacked on top of each other or if you have um other features so you gotta have like natural armor or physical armor but you can't have both i kind of wish you did <laughs> otherwise everyone would be op as hell 
Um, okay, so psionic sorcery. Oh, that's weird. You don't get anything up until sixth level. You thought you would get something at third. That's interesting. Maybe it's the spells, I suppose. Uh, psionic sorcery. Beginning at sixth level, when you cast any of the spells gained from psionics uh, spell features, you can cast it by expending a spell slot as normal or by spending a number of sorcery points equal to the spell's level. If you cast a spell using sorcery points, it requires no components. Well, that's handy. It's very handy. Uh, psychic defenses. At the sixth level, you gain resistance to psychic damage and you have advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened. Ooh. That's very handy. Uh, so you could go um, Elf or Half Elf and uh, prevent yourself from being charmed, which would be kind of a handy thing, but being frightened is a big one. So um, yeah, so if you ever go up against any dragons, that would be a very handy feature to have, especially when you have to make those uh, saving throws against being frightened against them. At a 14th level, we get Revelation in Flesh. Beginning at 14th level, you can unleash the aberrant truth hidden within your flesh. As a bonus action, you can spend one or more sorcery points to magically transform your body for one minute. Each sorcery point you spend, you gain one of the following benefits of your choice, the effects of which last until the transformation end. You gain a swimming speed equal to your walking speed and the ability to breathe water. Gills grow from your neck or a fan out from behind your ear. Your fingers become webbed or you grow a lashing cilia that extends through your clothing. Uh, you gain a flying speed equal to your walking speed and can hover. As you fly, your skin glistens with mucus. That's disgusting. <laughs> uh, your body, along with any equipment you are wearing or carrying, becomes slimy and pliable. You can move through any space as narrow as one inch without squeezing, and you can spend five, five feet of movement to escape from non-magical restraints or being grappled. That is very handy. That is very handy. Uh, your eyes turn black or become writhing sentry tendrils you are aware of the location of any hidden or invisible creatures within 60 feet of you oh that, that kind of gives like um uh like the supernatural demon eyes kind of appeal like just the there's flash black but that's kind of cool uh warp reality at 18th level you become the focal point of reality warping anomaly as an action, you can magically radiate a transparent 20-foot radius aura for one minute. This might take the form of a sphere of rippling sight, psychic energy, a fluctuating amoebic gel, an extrusion of inferior parasites, or some manifestation. Other creatures treat the aura as difficult terrain, and when they start their turn in it, they take 2d10 psychic damage. Wow. When you activate this feature, you can choose any, any number of creatures you can see to be affected by the area. As a bonus action, you can end the aura clearly. If you do so, you and any other number of creatures you choose within the aura are teleported to a, location, to a location you can see within one mile of you. Each creature must appear within 20 feet of you and is in an occupied space. An unwilling creature that succeeds a charisma saving throw against your spell. DC is not teleported. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. Okay, that's kind of interesting. I feel like it's lacking a bit. Just, um, I feel like maybe you could do something like a third level and that's about it. But other than that, it seems pretty decent. Um, this revelation flesh thing is very handy, especially when you can, you're can you not limited to choose just one. Um, so, like, so you can spend multiple and you could do each of these. So the best thing would probably be to every single time. It really depends on the situation you're in. So you could spend one and get the... Uh, the swim speed or even the eyes turn black you can spend two so you could swim be able to breathe underwater and you can see anything within 60 feet of you so that's essentially having um blind sight to an extent i know it's not exactly blind sight but it's very it's along those lines uh but yeah geez that is very handy <laughs> then to think you could technically get all four if you spent four sorcery points it wouldn't really make uh, that that much sense but this um this, this slimy one is very handy. You can spend five feet of movement to escape from a non-magical restraints or being grappled. I suppose at 14 level, if you're going to be um, restrained, it's probably going to be via magical restraints, but it's still pretty cool. Especially if your character gets knocked out and you get uh, locked in a prison or something and they don't realize you're a magical being and then it's like, you're gone. But uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. Then we have the Otherworldry Patron. At first level, a Warlock gains the Otherworldry Patron Paint, uh, patron feature here is a playtest option for that feature the lurker in the deep i actually had a quick look at this this i'm assuming they got um in uh, more than likely they probably got inspired via um, matt mercer's uh new patron um ukotoa for 
Travis uh, for Ford, who's uh, Travis Will Willingham's character. Just because I don't think they really had anything very um, uh, aquatic based. Because I know that uh, Travis's character was playing uh, a Hexblade and, and he had kind of a, a, a water based patron. So this is more like um, a concise version of that because uh, Travis was playing the Hexblade option, but he kind of had the um, water elements to his uh, class that Matt introduced as part of as he increased and grew favor with his patron. But uh, yeah, this seems kind of interesting. So you made a pact with an entity that lurks somewhere deep in the ocean or even on the elemental plane of water, such as a mighty kraken, an ancient primordial, or a monstrous being from a creatures from creation's early, earliest days. You serve as the creature's eyes and ears, watching the world beyond its domain and reporting your findings. You may have gained this pact as a member of a cult dedicated to the entity or after your patron saved your life when you nearly drowned at sea. Yeah, so that's, that's very much along the lines of uh, Ford's, uh, how he gained patronage with... Uh, Ukatoa. Uh, the Lurker's clutches. Several features of Lurker's Lurker in the Deep create several features of the Lurker in the Deep create tentacles or a maw that reaches in, reach into the world. The form of these appendages should reflect the nature of your sp sp specific patron. For example, a Kraken's Morlock might summon great squid-like tentacles, serrated crab claws, or a massive octopus beak, while the servant of a primordial water elemental might create tendrils or swells of living water. Oh, that's, a, that's a good thing to keep in mind. An expanded spell list uh, was the first feature you get with um, the L Lurker in the Deep feature. The Lurker in the Deep lets you choose from an expanded spell list when you learn a Warlock spell. The following spells are added to the Warlock spell list for you. Uh, create or Destroy Water, Thunder Wave, Gust of Wind, Silence, um, Lightning Bolt, Sleet Storm, Control Water, Evard's Black Tentacles, Commune with Nature, and Cone of Cold. Not too bad. I don't think Cone of Cold really works as well as some of the other ones, but I suppose that's neither here nor there. Uh, Grasp of the Deep. At first level, you gain the ability to magically summon a spectral, spectral tentacle that strikes at your foes. As a bonus action, you create a 10-foot long tentacle at a point you can see within 60 feet of you. The tentacle lasts for one minute or until you use this feature to create another tentacle. When you create the tentacle, you can make a melee spell attack against the creature uh, within 10 feet of you on a hit, the target takes 1d8 cold or lightning damage, your choice when it takes the damage, and its speed is reduced by 10 until the start of your next turn. I think that's going to be a little bit overpowered, so you can kind of change the damage type to um, reflect what you want in the moment. So I, I'd say once once you pick this, when you um, summon this, you have to choose whether or, you not, whether or not you want to do cold or lightning damage when you, when you summon it, because it'll be like the cold tentacle or the lightning tentacle, and you have either one. You can't just go, okay, gold damage. Oh, he seems to have resistance, so I'll use lightning next time. No, I wouldn't say that'd be very effective. Although you could just use a bonus action to create a new one, but I don't know. And its speed is reduced by 10 feet until the start of its next turn. When you reach 10th level in this class, the damage dealt by the tentacle increases to 2d8. As a bonus action on your turn, you can move the tentacle up to 30 feet and repeat the attack. You can summon the tentacle a number of times equal to your charisma modifier, a minimum of, of once. And you gain all, regain all expended spell uses when you finish a long rest. Okay, that's not too bad. Scion of the Deep. At first level, your patron accepts you into its inner courts, court of servitors. You can telepathically communicate with any aberration, beast, elemental, or monstrosity that has innate swimming speed. While it is 120 feet of you, the creature can understand you and respond telepathically. That is very kind of interesting. Okay. So anything that has a, a swimming speed, you can technically talk to. That That is, uh, that sounds very uh, OP, I suppose, but the majority of the time it's going to be like a case of like, if you want to communicate with them, they'll probably say, oh, there's a morsel, I'll eat them. More than likely, unless it's a sentient thing and maybe would commune for um, the sake of um, trying to benefit themselves. Uh, at 6th level, your patron grants you greater abilities. You gain the following benefits. You can breathe both air and water. Jesus. You gain a swimming speed equal to your walking speed. Okay, that's kind of okay. You gain resistance to cold damage. Okay. The both can breathe both air and water. It's a cool feature. Fathomless soul. That is very handy. 
uh, Guardian Grasp. At six level, the tentacle you create with Grasp of the Deep can defend you and others when you when you or a creature you see takes damage well within 10 feet of the tentacle you can use your reaction to choose one of the one of those creatures and reduce the damage to the chosen creature by half after doing so the tentacle vanishes okay that's interesting um yeah that's pretty that's pretty cool little feature uh devouring maw starting at 10th level you can magically draw forth uh, a manifestation of your patrons patrons insatiable hunger as an action choose a point you can see within 60 feet of you for one minute a translucent maw manifests in a 10 foot radius centered on that point each creature in that area when the maw appears must succeed on strength saving throw against your spell dc or spell save dc or be restrained any creature that starts its turn in the maw uh, takes 3d6 cold or lightning damage your choice when it takes damage um Okay, back to it. So, I would say that you would have to choose either between cold or lightning damage before before you use the feature. So, if you're like, oh, I want to use Devouring Maw, I'd say, okay, uh, the damage will be cold, and then the creatures either move into it or fail their saves or and whatnot. Um, as an action, a restrained creature can repeat the saving throw, ending the strain on a success at the start of your turn. If there is a creature in the Maw's area, you gain temporary hit points equal to your Warlock level. Okay, that's interesting. Once using this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. And, of course, temporary hit points don't stack. Um, and unleash the depths. Starting at 14th level, you gain the ability to call upon your patron for aid. As an action, you, you choose a point within 30 feet of you where your patron tears to reality, manifesting a measure of its tal talisic grand grandeur uh choose one of the following effects to issue from this manifestation point once you use either effect you can't use this feature again until you finish a long rest uh transport you and up to five willing creatures of your choice that you can see within 30 feet of the manifestation point are grasped by spectral spectral tentacles and yanked through your patron's realm the tentacles teleport you and the chosen creatures to a point of your choice within 100 miles that you have visited within the, last, the past 24 hours the tentacles then vanish Fury, you can direct a barrage of spectrals, tentacles to issue forth and strike up to five creatures you can see within 30 feet of the manifestation point. Each target must make a dexterity saving throw against your spell save. On a failed save, the creature takes 60, 10 cold damage or lightning damage. Again, I would say this, you'd have to make a, um, uh, the decision to make it before you activate the ability, but other than that, it's fine. And is knock prone on a, success, on a successful save that it takes half as much damage and is not knock prone. The tentacles then vanish. Okay, that transport feature is fucking powerful. But like that would be a great feature if you, if you're in a battle and you need to get out of there and it's like we can't run because we'll just get hit from every every which way and then the warlock just goes bam and everyone just teleports as far away as possible. A uh, new spell, uh, a new spell cantrip suitable for psionic themed spellcasters is presented here, uh, Mind Sliver. It appears on the Sorcerer, Warlock, and Wizard spell lists. Mind Sliver, and it's an enchantment cantrip, uh, one action for casting time, range of 60 feet, only verbal components, and duration is one round. You drive a disorientating spike of psychic energy into the mind of one creature you can see within range. The target must make an intelligent saving throw. Unless the saving throw is successful, the target takes 1d6 psychic damage. And the first time it makes a saving throw before the end of your next turn, it must roll a 1d4 and, and uh, subtract the number of rolls from it to save. The spelled, uh, spell's damage increases by 1d6 when you reach certain levels 5th uh, with 2d6, 11th at 3d6, and 17th at 4d6. This would be very handy against um, barbarians. Especially if, and uh, and probably more than likely most um, most monsters, unless you're maybe you're going up against a uh, a uh, what are they called, the aboliths and mind flares. Other than that, this is very very handy feature. Especially if they fail it, they take the damage, and then on their next uh, saving throw, they must roll a one d four, or before the end of your next turn, um, you got to roll a one d four and reduce it. Which could be a very handy, uh, handy feature, especially if you want to um, hit him up. So, like for example, you want to hit the barbarian with some sort of spell, and then um, perhaps it has a really high uh, dexterity saving throw, or 
Constitution, obviously they, they will. I think both of them are an advantage. But anyways, um, so yeah, you could hit them with that, get them to roll at a lower roll, a lower number, and possibly you could uh, combine it with another another uh, spellcaster, another party member to see if they could set it to disadvantage. So you could probably get that person or that enemy off the battlefield, like a uh, banishment or something. That would be a very handy spell, or even just to, um, I don't know, maybe charm them or anything. But yeah, that's a very interesting uh, feature. Especially when it's only a cantrip and it goes up to 46. I know damage-wise it's not, it's not amazing, it's not like a um, uh, Firebolt or Eldritch Blast, but still being able to deal 1d6 and then then the the uh, enemy has to take uh, takes a negative uh, 1d4 on their next uh, uh, what do you call it saving throw within the within your next turn is a very handy feature. But yeah, the spell is very interesting or not spell the the classes. Um, I like the sorcerer. I, once again, I still think they might they might need something in between first and sixth level just. I suppose they're going to have a lot of spell features or uh, class features in between that, but I suppose that could be it. And um, other the other the uh, warlock feature, I, f I feel like it could be similar. Uh, maybe just giving it something in between first and sixth, maybe something at third. Uh, but at, again, the features are actually quite uh, powerful, uh, especially this fathomless soul one. That is very handy, and this uh, sign of the deep. That's a very interesting one, especially if you can uh, talk to sentient being or relatively sentient beings i think it has to be, they have to be sentient no the creature can understand you and respond telepathically okay so it doesn't even have to um it doesn't have to even be a uh a sentient being you could just talk to something that has like a fucking intelligence of one and just tell it to do something and it might do it but yeah that's pretty interesting um i'll put a link in the description below for you guys to download this yourselves but yeah it's definitely worth it um it's an interesting little thing I like the, um, I'm a big fan of the, the Warlock one, I, I just like that it was water um, based uh, Warlocks, especially after seeing uh, Travis Willingham's Ford in action, it kind of, it kind of would expire you, expire, I keep saying expire, but inspire you to go to um, those kind of weird aquatic based uh, elements, but yeah, it's still very interesting. Sorcerer's, Sorcerer seems fun, um, the Psychic basis of its uh, spells seems interesting it's almost like kind of like um i forget what that what that that um class is called the one that has all its the psionic damage it might be actually be a psionic but i'm not sure um i can't remember the top of my head at the moment but yeah she'll end it there uh thanks everyone for watching hope you enjoyed please like and subscribe and i'll see you guys next time bye